Well, the Most High be praised. Hallelujah. I want to say shalom to each one of you today on this seventh day of Hanukkah. We're thankful to the Almighty for his goodness and his graciousness to us. Right now, as you can see, I'm not in the sanctuary. I'm up here in the Alaska region right now. And we bless the Almighty for his goodness and his kindness. And we're so grateful for another day to be alive, for another day to be able to celebrate our King. And the first thing we want to do before we get into our short teaching today is we want to open in a word of prayer. So let's do that. Abba Yah, thank you for your mercies, your kindness, and your graciousness to us today. We bless you for the forgiveness of sins. We bless you for Yahshua, our King, and all that he has done for us. We bless you for bringing us into this seventh day of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. And we praise you for our salvation that we have in the Messiah. Now, Abba Yah, I ask that you would give wisdom to me to be able to share in this teaching. May it help and edify the hearts of each one that's attending today. And may your people continue to rejoice in this season of celebration and rededication. So we thank you now in Yahshua's great name. Amen. Well, the Most High be praised today. Again, I'm thankful for us being able to be in this season of Hanukkah. I trust that all of you in Yahshua have been blessed and that you have been celebrating and remembering this season in the Feast of Dedication as we're remembering the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple. And also we are considering ourselves in that we are the temple of Elohim. And we also should be considering the importance of rededicating ourselves to the Almighty during this season. Now today what I want to do, I want to um, share from a scripture that's just been rolling in my mind and in my heart all week. I've just been hearing it over and over and over again, and I want to talk about it. I uh, don't intend to be very long in this teaching, hopefully uh, 20 minutes to a half hour at the most, uh, Abba willing, unless he, you know, kind of steers us down a path of teaching. Sometimes I don't always know, <laughs> uh, but... Um, we want to be able to communicate with you today from the scripture found in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And I may read through the verse 7, but verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians are the verses that I would like to focus on. So, when we begin at verse 4 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, listen to what this says. It says, my speech and my proclamation or my preaching were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in human wisdom, but on the power of Elohim. Scripture's been turning over and over in my head. Of course, I'm so used to uh, reading Scripture from the King James Version, the, the passage, uh, when it came to me, it, 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 it would state that your Faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Elohim. So, in looking at these verses, when Paul was talking to the saints 
of the Messianic Israelite community there in Corinth. He was reminding them of how he was when he first came to them. And he said that I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men. That little phrase in verse 4 where it's translated here as plausible words of wisdom in ancient translations, uh, uh, it's translated as the persuasiveness of wisdom's words. And when we look at that actually in the Greek language, wisdom's words, it's a phrase there in the Greek called sophias logios, wisdom's words. And what Paul was hinting at when he makes the statement has to do with the wisdom of the culture when he was preaching in Corinth, he was in a region that was highly Hellenistic. Greek culture to the max. And if you know anything about the Greek culture, they believe strongly in the wisdom of men the philosophy of men. They believed that wisdom was the highest thing. The philosopher, especially Aristotle and many of the others, they used this word logios, which is a word that's rooted in the word logos. When I say logos, most people who read the scriptures refer to logos with respect to the word. Because in the Bible it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. And of course, that word used, that is translated word, is logos. That's the closest word in the Greek to express this reality of all things from a Hebrew perspective. But you see, the philosophers use this word logos to refer to that which is spoken. In particular, that which is spoken from the thought. Because the word logos also means thought and reason. And so, when they use this word log logios or logois, that's the proper way to, to read it, they were really hinting at the reasoning or the logic of men. Matter of fact, what's very interesting, you know, we use this word logic. And we talk about that which is logical or that which is reasonable. In our culture, we use these terms to express either concepts ways of doing things or responses to behaviors based upon what has been the established understanding among people. Because you see, the, the term logic and the term reason or something that's logical or reasonable is really subjective to whatever definition you attach to it or whatever concept you attach to it. It's subjective. And seeing that it comes from the Greek word, and I'm talking about the word logic here, that word logic actually comes from the word logos. Hmm, isn't that interesting? 
same word that's used to refer to the word of Elohim. Logic. That which is logical, that which makes sense, that which is reasonable. And anytime we start talking about what's logical or what's reasonable or that which makes sense, we begin immediately to understand that that terminology is subjective to a particular philosophy of life. So here when Paul is talking and he is saying, when I came to you, I didn't come to you in the manner that you are accustomed to. I didn't come to you with the philosophy of the age that you are accustomed to. No doubt they probably thought when he came to them that he was going to come with some of the wisdom of the Greek, so he was going to put it together in a certain way that it would make sense to them in their way of understanding the deities. But he said, rather, I came to you with a demonstration of power by the Spirit of Elohim. Oh, man. So he came to them a whole different way, he says. And he said, this is the reason why I came to you, not with enticing words, not with persuasive philosophy, because I know y'all are already accustomed to that. He said, I didn't come to you as a great orator, because Paul himself said, he, you know, he testified that he was not really a great orator. He, he was not one of those preachers in, in my imagination that knew how to put it together in such a way that would touch the emotions of people and excite them to a degree where they would be in awe. That wasn't Paul. <laughs> you know, he, he wasn't concerned about how to be able to speak in such a way where he would elevate and bring down the tonations of his voice so that people would recognize how great of a speaker he was. Maybe like Apollos. Apollos was a little bit better on that. <laughs> Paul said straight up, he said, listen, I didn't come to you like that. I came to you in demonstration and in the power of the Spirit. And this is why. Because I did not want your faith in Elohim to stand or to be resting and founded on the wisdom of men, human wisdom. He said, I didn't want your belief, your faith, to be rooted in a philosophy. He said, I wanted you to understand that your faith, the foundation of it, is built upon the power of the Most High. That your faith is built. It's resting on. It's established by the demonstration of Elohim's power. He said, when I came preaching the Messiah, Yahshua, to you, I told you who he was. I told you what he did. And just in case you had any doubts about this power, just in case you had any doubts about the way in which we presented the prophecy of the scriptures and how we use the scriptures to confirm and validate the fact that Yahshua from Nazareth is indeed the Messiah, power of Elohim was demonstrated among you. The sick were healed among you. Those who were possessed with evil spirits were freed and they were now normal. He said, I didn't come to you trying to use the vain philosophy of the age to try to get you to embrace this word that I was preaching. 
He said, but the power of Elohim, the dunamai, this is the Greek word for it, of Elohim is what was demonstrated so that your faith might have a foundation that's not like everyone else's. <clears throat> Now, when I, when I looked at this, and especially thinking about the time period that we're in right now in this season of Hanukkah, and how, how we are rejoicing in Elohim and remembering the mighty miracles of Elohim, remembering what he has done for our ancient fathers, how he preserved our ancient Judean Israelite ancestors, and by doing that, he preserved the promise of Yahshua coming into the world. Because after all, you, you, you got to accept this truth. That if, when the Judean Israelites were faced with the possibility of being annihilated because they chose not to embrace the deities of the Greeks, they were going to be annihilated as a people. You know that if there were no Judean Israelites to continue the worship of Elohim, then that means that our Messiah, Yahshua, would not have had the possibility to come into this world. That's a reality, and that's something that no doubt Hasatan, Satan wanted to see accomplished. He didn't want the Messiah to come. And even though the religious leaders of that time in the second century BCE, even though the religious leaders were corrupt to allow a pagan to come into the temple grounds of Elohim and erect the statue of Zeus. Yet, the Almighty still, in his sovereignty, touched many to go against the edict of King Antiochus and preserve the faith of Israel and trusted in Elohim to be able to recover the temple and continue with the worship of the Most High Yah. See, the thing about this is that the whole system of the Greeks being to take over the religion of Israel, being to come and bring them under the dominion, the religious dominion of the Greeks. Since that was their aim, that was their goal. The Most High could not let that happen. And the way that the Almighty did it was simply by signs and wonders and miracles. Because he wanted his people to realize that the recovery of the temple was not through the mighty power of those small guerrilla bands in Israel. Because, you see, the Greek armies was a massive army. Antiochus had a massive army. Thousands and thousands and thousands. And here you had these small Judean Israelites with their guerrilla warfare that they had organized amongst themselves to fight against this massive Greek army. But as is noted over in the book of 2 Maccabees chapter 10, when you read in there in the first verse, it says that Maccabeus and his followers it says, Yahuwah being with them. See, that, that, that's what made the difference. Yahuwah was with them, and because Yahuwah was with them, they were able to recover the temple and keep the faith of Israel preserved. 
All of this occurred because of the might and the power of Elohim. See, our faith is not based upon a philosophy. Our faith is not based upon, well, you know, uh, 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 if, 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 if it makes sense to you, you know, that um, Elohim came and sent his son and Elohim did. You know, a lot of times when we preach and when we teach, especially in this Western world, much of the preaching and teaching is done in a way which is very Hellenistic, if I might add. Because many of the Bible teachers approach it at an angle where they're constantly performing what is called apologetics. It's a way in which you provide an argument to prove that your faith is correct. And let me say this, while it is good for us to understand the scriptures in detail in regards to our faith, understanding the scriptures in detail for the purposes of understanding our faith rightly is for our benefit. It's so that we can believe and understand Elohim right so that we might know how to properly live and carry out our faith in the manner that pleases him. But so oftentimes, we go through this whole system of proving the rightness of our faith, proving the rightness of our Elohim. And it's gotten so much so to the place where so oftentimes, we try to make Elohim look like he can do no wrong in the sense that it would offend men. It's like we got to take every single action of Elohim where it might appear that he was over the top, where it might appear that he is overboard. We got to try and find a reason to explain Elohim in the Bible in places where people might question Elohim's judgment or Elohim's action, or they might feel like, well, you know, Yahuwah, he went too far on that one because men are so concerned about what seems logical, what seems reasonable to them. And if they feel like Elohim is not reasonable or if Elohim is not logical, in his actions, his activities, or even in his commandments. I mean, now, you know, the whole Western Christian system in their beginnings, we going back, say, to the fourth century, when what came to be known as the Catholic Church came to the scene, they began to remove and get rid of the necessity for keeping the commandments of Elohim by using logic. That's right, using logic. A thought expressing an idea that someone has about a concept. They began to say, you know what? We don't need to keep Passover. You don't need to keep Passover anymore. You don't need to do all of those things that are Jewish. Why? Because first of all, the Jews rejected Yahshua. This is their reason. This is their logic. The Jews rejected Yahshua. So now since he did, they did that. You know, we don't need to uh, follow those things because Elohim's not with them anymore. And, and, and Elohim has fulfilled all of those things that those commandments point to. They use a spiritualization of the commandments of the Most High to invalidate the keeping of the commandments through logic. <laughs> through, through what the Greeks call this logos. That which is spoken from the thought of a concept, the reason. And when Paul came, he said, I did not come trying to give you a philosophy 
or a system of apologetics. I, I didn't come trying to tell you why you should believe in predestination or why you should believe in the Trinity in comparison to a oneness concept. He said, I didn't come, I didn't come preaching to you, trying to philosophize and make you understand or to try to appeal to what you already know so that you can embrace this Elohim that I'm preaching. No, that was the MO of the Roman Catholic system. They were the ones who began doing that. But what Paul said, I came to you with demonstration and in power. Paul said, all I did was come to you and, and told you what the prophet said about Yahshua. And I told you how Yahshua fulfilled it. And for those of y'all who did not believe that Yahshua was indeed the one, for all the naysayers who did not believe that Yahshua is the one, Signs and wonders and miracles began to take place. All of those who had negative things to say in regards to the message that I preached, the power of Elohim was demonstrated to close their mouths. And you see, today, we have to understand that this faith that we embrace, although it is logical, from the perspective of Elohim, it's logical. From the perspective of the wisdom and the prophetic word of Elohim, it's logical. From his angle, it's logical to us. To the world, it's not logical. Because the world can't understand how Elohim can come into the world, impregnate a virgin, and then bring forth the Messiah who is called the express image of Elohim. The world can't understand that in this age in which we live because they have embraced this idea that man is the measure of all things. It cannot embrace the idea of spiritual merging with natural and producing Mashiach. No, it don't understand that. It, it, it can readily embrace only that which is tangible, only that which comes from evolution, only that which can only be seen, touched, felt, heard. But the intangible, no, it wants to bypass that. And so our faith that we have, it's still based upon the power of Elohim. There's some in the world today when you start talking about the supernatural, when you start talking about what Elohim can do, when you start talking about the fact that there's prophecy that's been put out, there's prophecy that Elohim has made known. When you start talking about the prophecies of Elohim, people begin to say, oh, that's just a bunch of legends. No, it's not a bunch of legends. But guess what's going to happen? Not long. Elohim is going to cause all of those prophecies that men might call legend, that men might call fables, that men might call fantasies, all of that stuff that men mock at, is going to soon roll itself out in time. And everything that's prophesied in the, the scriptures is going to indeed come to pass, and the naysayers are going to have to bow the knee to the Messiah. The naysayers are going to have to understand that everything that they believed on because they trusted in the philosophy of the age, they trusted in the wisdom of men because they could not embrace the supernatural power of Elohim they're going to have to bow down to. I want to read verse 6 and 7 of chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians because Paul here begins to add a little bit to what he said. He wanted to make it plain that he came preaching and operating in the demonstration and power so that the foundation of their faith would not be in the wisdom of men but in Elohim's power. That's where our faith needs to reside. 
Some people are so caught up in the fact that they want to act like, well, you know, that there's, there's only so many books in the Bible. And, and, and if you believe that there are more books in the Bible, then you're a heretic. We've got so many people nowadays that are so caught up in the whole deal of trying to cause those who don't believe in their particular position or their particular philosophy about the Bible, its, trans its translation or its transmission. They want to demonize everything that's not like their perspective. Instead of teaching people, our faith doesn't rest in the philosophy of men. Even if it is a religious philosophy, our faith doesn't rest in it. Our faith rests in the power of the Most High. Well, let me read this in verse 6 and 7 as I wrap this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, immediately following verse 5, it says, Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom. Paul said, even though we don't want your faith to be hinged and your faith to be founded in the wisdom of men, we want you to know that we are still speaking wisdom. Though it is not a wisdom of this age. Catch that? Paul wanted to make it very clear to those folk he was talking to, the wisdom that we're talking about, it ain't the wisdom of this age. He says, look, believer, you need to understand as soon as you see somebody coming with a view and a philosophy that is against the scriptures, you need to put a hand up to it. You need to back that thing up. You need to understand that, listen, it is not acceptable for us. The wisdom of the age is not acceptable for us. Now, yes, Paul was saying these things in the first century. 1900 years ago roughly he was saying these things but the, the the nuts and bolts of what Paul was saying is no different today just as the spirit of the age in which we live today is still as Hellenistic and Greek culture even though they don't want to call it that it is still as much Greek cultured in its way of understanding the philosophy of life as it was in the first century. And so today we say this wisdom we speak is not the wisdom of this age. It's not the wisdom of this culture. Nor, and I'm going to continue to read, or of the rulers of this age. In other words, the wisdom that we preach is not based upon the kings and the government and the systems that exist in our world mm -hmm. who are doomed to perish. So let me tell you something. Philosophy of this world, philosophy of the educational system, the philosophy of the religious system that is tied to an idea that somehow Elohim has two people in the earth. Let me be quite frank. Because we've got a, a whole lot of mess going on right now. In and around us. A couple hundred years ago, almost a couple hundred years ago. There was a religious concept that came on the scene called dispensationalism and it proposed that Elohim has two covenant peoples, one called Israel, the other called the church, and that Elohim is doing two separate things with these two peoples that are his, that he has two programs going on with it. Now, those who believe this idea and who do not believe that Elohim has only one covenant of people in the earth, especially in this country, have found themselves believing that Elohim is going to bless those that bless Israel. And when they understand this, they're talking about Israel being the state of Israel. And they're also believing that he is going to bless the church because the church supports the state of Israel. 
When we look in the Bible, we believe firmly that Elohim is going to bless those who bless Israel. We believe that firmly. We believe that Elohim is going to bless his covenant people. We believe that firmly because you can't change the scripture. The question is, who is the real Israel of Elohim? Because you see, just because you might be a blood descendant or you claim to be a blood descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob don't mean that you are in the true house of Israel. Paul made a statement and he was the one who said, hmm, not everyone that says that they are Israel that they are of Israel is Israel. He said, but those who are of the promise. When the Bible talks about the promise, he's talking about those who remain in the covenant, the covenantal framework of Elohim that we are in today is through the Messiah Yahshua, and everybody who's not attached to the Messiah Yahshua is not in the real Israel. There is a real Israel in the earth, but Elohim is working to get the lost descendants who are not in Yahshua yet to come into Yahshua yet, and prophecy, words spoken by the prophet, is still out there. Well, Elohim said that he's going to recover. He's going to wave his hand the second time and he's going to recover his descendants that are in the many places scattered. He talked about from Assyria and in Egypt and Pathros and, and Cush and, uh, and, and in the islands. He said all of the places where they're scattered, where they are worshiping other deities. He said, I'm going to bring them out of their uncleanness. He's going to do it. And he said he's going to bring them back into the fold. He still only has one covenant people. But the problem with those who believe that Elohim has two covenant people is, is this. When you begin to identify the church separate and distinct from Israel, and you begin to say that the church is attached to a particular nation, because you got many in this world who believe that the United States of America is a Christian nation. And, I, and I'm very bold in my declaration to say that the United States of America is not a Christian nation. Never has been, never will be. There's only one nation on the planet, and that is the house of Israel and the Messiah that Elohim is in covenant with, and every human being on the planet is to come into that. Now, the United States of America has been greatly influenced by the Bible. It has been greatly influenced by the Christian religion. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not, don't get it twisted. I understand the history of this country quite well, probably better than most. I'm just willing to see it for what it is and what the prophecy of the scriptures have declared it to be. But what we must understand is that this country, the United States of America, is a part of the beast kingdom. And that's a reality that most, most believers don't want to accept. They have an allegiance to this country as though the country itself was indeed Israel. And it is not. And when we understand and see what the country is for itself, and I'm not saying that it's, that it's a, 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 a bad thing, place or seriously bad place in comparison to other countries. It, it is what it is. It's a part of the Babylonian Roman Edomite system. It is what it is. So it's not a surprise that everything that goes on in it and that the governmental system that exists in it is tied to a Roman and Greek based philosophy. It is what it is. 
The problem is that we have many believers who do not wish to embrace that truth. And as a result, it has caused much division in this country because you have a select group of believers, Western Christian evangelicals that believe so strongly so that they want to have righteousness legislated in a country because of the opportunity to be able to vote. Yes, we are to always be salt and light, but we cannot legislate righteousness, and we must understand that every governmental system in this world is under the authority of the beast kingdom. Now, I know that's a hard pill for many to swallow. But for those who have an ear to hear and a heart to receive, it's important that you receive this so that you'll know how to relegate your religious ties. You need to make a distinction between the house of Israel and the Messiah and the nation that you live in. When you merge the two together, then what happens is that you bring about confusion and you want to cause things to happen that Elohim don't have anything to do with. And so what we got going on right now, we got many brothers and sisters. Hmm, I call them brothers and sisters because they believe in the Messiah, Yahshua. Anyone who believes in the Messiah, Yahshua is my brother and my sister. But I have some serious differences of opinion and theological positions when it comes to how people see this country and how people see the people of Elohim. And what we need to understand is that with what's going on in the nation and many of the so-called prophets that have been prophesying about the election, prophesying that Mr. Trump is going to have another uh, term and all of that. I mean, prophesying it like as if the Most High just dropped it down. And now some of them are having to apologize for what they have stated. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm neither Democratic nor Republican, so it don't make a difference to me. I'm on the side of Yah. So it don't make a difference to me who you choose, whatever. You vote according to your conscience. But the problem remains is that when you have religious leaders that are prophesying, putting word out to the masses on radio, TV, and then when it doesn't happen, they have to go back and retract it. Let me tell you something. Y'all better be careful. Y'all better be careful. You don't just go haphazardly declare what Elohim is going to do with all surety and then all of a sudden when it doesn't happen, you have to go back and retract it. You just lost your credibility. But those who do these things do it because they already have a preconceived theological perspective and religious construct on how they see the country that they live in, and the people of Elohim. I've always said it. A person's theological perspective has a whole lot to do with how they understand the Most High and how they understand Scripture. But for those of you who believe in trying to always be down the middle of the road to try to always hear the Almighty, because uh, let me tell you something. I believe in the prophetic. Mm -hmm. I've been raised up around the prophetic, and I, I know the real from the false. I know the shenanigans from that which is real. I don't know about everybody else, because I know how the Most High has worked to bring his confirmation into my life through those prophets and apostles that I've been around and that I've come up under. I know the real, but there are many who don't know the real. You see, you don't just go and put word out unless it is 
truly indeed from Elohim. We don't go and prophesy guessing because we want to see something happen so bad. I'm telling you, the Most High is trying to help his people to come to the place of truth. But let's, let's understand something. Let's understand something. See, when we begin to do these things, what happens is that the faith of many people becomes disturbed. Right now, there are many people whose faith has been shaken as a result of not seeing these prophecies that many of these evangelical prophets, so-called prophets, I don't know what to call them, because the Bible says that if a person prophesies a thing and the thing don't come to pass, then they they have not heard from Elohim. They're not a prophet of Elohim. So you, you take the information of the scripture and you deal with it however you want to deal with it. But the point of the matter is many people are having their faith shaken as a result of what others have declared. But my word to us is that you understand that when Elohim moves you don't need to make something happen. Elohim don't need my help. He don't need your help. He don't need anybody's help to move in power and might. He can do it all by himself. But the thing that the Most High requires is, is that we be submissive and obedient to his commandments. Most important thing to the Most High is that we learn how to fear him and keep his commandments. With all of this stuff and this junk that's going on right now, it's brought so much confusion that you've got neophytes, neophytes, immature believers that are listening to these so-called prophets going out and causing havoc in the community, going out and doing things to the destruction of others because they want to make something happen that somebody prophesied. It's a dangerous place to be in. But my word to us is, may your faith not stand in the wisdom of men. May it not stand in the logic of men. May it not stand in the philosophy. It don't, it don't matter whether... It is the philosophy of the humanists. It don't matter whether it's the philosophy of the capitalists. It don't matter whether it's the philosophy of the evangelical community. Yes, I said it. Your faith is to be in the power of Elohim and his word. Keep his commandments. For those of you who want to know the right path, who want to know what to do in these confusing times, bury your face in the word. Read the commandments and keep the commandments. Let me, let, let me tell you something. Over in the book of 1 John, it says, By this we know that we know him. Because in this day, we need to know Yahshua. How do we know him? How do we know him? By this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, listen, you want to stay on the right path? You want to come out of confusion? You want to know what to do right now so that you don't get and go down a slippery slope? Just keep the commandments. Read the commandments, keep the commandments. Don't listen to everything else out there. Don't listen to all of the other stuff. Don't listen to this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Don't listen to, oh, it ain't over yet. No, don't listen to all that mess. Because the Most High could care less about all that mess. He already declared the end at the beginning. There's nothing else that he needs to declare. He already declared the world's kingdoms and how everything was going to roll out and that in the end of the age the Messiah is going to overthrow them. Let's allow the world systems and their kingdoms just to play out what is going to play out. All right? Quit trying to focus on all of that. 
But we need to focus on the word and keeping the commandments of Elohim, living righteous according to the Torah of the Most High, walking in love in the earth, being shalom makers, creators of environments of shalom. That even when people don't like us, we still are going to love them and be obedient to the word of Elohim. Let me tell you something. We need to be that kind of an example. Not arguing with folk about political philosophy or religious philosophy. The most high could care less about all that junk. We're supposed to be obeying the commandments and helping people to stay in the obedience of the scriptures. That's what's going to alleviate the confusion in this time. And I want to encourage each one of you who are listening, each one of you that might be wondering, what should I do? Who should I listen to? You know, I don't know. This one's saying this, this one's saying that. Read your Bible. Be obedient to the word. Leave the world to the world. Leave the political system to the political system. Leave all of that to that. Obey the book and let the Most High have its way in you. Hallelujah. And he will work out the things that need to be worked out in your life. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you so much for your mercies, your kindness, your grace. I pray, Abba Yah, that the word that we have shared today has done something to help the hearer, that it has helped to provide them with your wisdom regarding what they should do during this time, and that most of all, it causes you to be lifted up, that you would guide us and direct us in shalom, and that your great name would be praised. Now, Father, I do bless you, and I give your name the glory for everything that is accomplished. Work mightily among your people. Strengthen your people. May you be glorified. Cover the innocent. Cover the oppressed. Meet the needs of those who are sick and afflicted, those who are hungry, those who are jobless, those who are suffering as a result of the pandemic. May your hand of deliverance cover them. May your great name be praised. And we will bless you in Yahshua's great name. Amen. Well, I trust that the teaching was a blessing to those of you who were attending today and that it encouraged you and that it was able to answer some questions in your own mind and in your own hearts. And for those who consider this ministry to be a blessing, you consider us to be a viable vehicle of giving truth to the nations, then we ask you to uh, support the work by giving to Elohim. And you can go to our website at www.ncmmi. Dot 20 m dot com. You can click on the donate button and share with us. You can also share with us by Cash App. Our Cash App code is dollar sign NCMMI. We thank each of you so much for your support and trust that our teaching is helping you to grow in your faith and providing you with counsel and direction by the Ruach that is being helpful for you and your family. Again, Happy Hanukkah to all of you. Enjoy this season. Enjoy the Most High. And give thanks for His mercies, His kindness, and His miracles. And remember, don't let your faith rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Elohim. Shalom.